Welcome, my dear students and my YouTube viewers, to Chapter 1's coverage of Molecules and Numbers. In this video, I will teach you about atoms, molecules, and mixtures. But first, beyond the information presented in an earlier intro video that I've linked to in the description below, I want to go into greater depth answering the question, why should we even study chemistry? Well, chemistry is a fundamental science devoted to studying the near infinite number of physical interactions that occur all around and inside of us. Chemistry is an essential bedrock field for anyone interested in pursuing scientific, engineering, or medical careers. Organic chemists, <laughs> which is what I happen to be, yay, in particular, are an integral component in inventing new medicines. With proper accreditation, students with bachelor's degrees in chemistry can enjoy prosperous careers as industry researchers or public educators. Chemists that have more advanced degrees can teach in community colleges or universities, or they can work as industry research leaders, business professionals, patent attorneys, or public political advisors. Now, for more information, this is for my Utah State University students specifically, not for my YouTube subscribers, sorry, please read over the document entitled Mike's Career Advice, which you can access from our Canvas homepage if you're interested. It's just my own personal advice. <laughs> With that out of the way, I now welcome you to Freshman General Chemistry. So if you watch and learn the information presented in this lecture series over the course of this semester, then you should, by the end, understand the basic principles of general chemistry, be able to explain basic everyday chemical phenomena and apply your knowledge to solving real world problems and be able to explain why chemistry is important and how it applies to everyday life. Now, just so you know, my recommended text for this class is this one right here, Chemistry, the Central Science, 12th edition by Brown, LeMay, Burstead, and a zillion other authors of Walla Walla Bing Bing. And I think they're currently on the 78th edition or something like that. To be honest, for my university students, you can use older editions or newer editions. Beyond that, I do not require this specific text for my course. I instead recommend at minimum buying a college general chemistry text of some sort so you can at least use its tables and other information for reference. However, this is the recommended text specific to my course, if you care. So now that we all feel super welcome, I want to begin with a hilarious joke. Chemistry cat of the day. Yeah, I like to steal these off of quickmeme.com because I think they're funny. Here goes. Do you have mass? Do you occupy space? Then you matter. Ha 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 ha. Okay, so after this chapter, chapter one, you should be able to do the following things. In other words, this is a list of skills that you will have once you get through studying chapter one. First, you'll be able to define the following terms, a long list of vocabulary, which I'm not gonna read for you here. I will instead explain to you later on. Second, you should be able to classify a substance as being a mixture, either a homogeneous or heterogeneous mixture, a pure substance, an element, or a compound. And third, you'll need to have memorized a few specific SI units that I will cover later on, as well as the following prefixes, milli, micro, nano, and kilo, as well as their values. Again, we'll cover that later on. Beyond this, you should also be able to, if given the formulas, interconvert between Kelvin, Fahrenheit, and Celsius temperatures, make calculations using the proper number of significant figures, know how to interconvert between units, which is a technique called unit analysis or dimensional analysis, and use density, which is mass divided by volume, to interconvert between mass and volume. So that's pretty much the lineup of the skills we're gonna tackle in this chapter. Are you ready? Then let's get to it. Starting with a large list of vocabulary. The first term that we're gonna learn is matter. Matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. Good? Good. The next one is element. An element is the most basic unit of matter, unable to be broken down into smaller units through chemical means. My simple definition of this is the things found on the periodic table, which we'll discuss in greater depth later on. For right now, though, here's a piece of cool trivia in case you're ever on a quiz show. As it turns out, 90% of the Earth's entire crust, including the oceans and the atmosphere, is comprised of just five elements, oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, and calcium, which I boxed in these kind of yellow boxes here. Additionally, 90% of our bodies are comprised of just three elements, oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. There's also some nitrogen, which is element number seven over here in our bodies as well, and some other stuff too. It's just so interesting that when you take just a small handful of elements and bond them together in a variety of different ways, what major differences you can get in terms of overall structure and function. It's just fascinating. Isn't chemistry awesome? So with that said, let's continue with our vocabulary. The next term is atoms. Atoms are the infinitesimally small building blocks of matter. For instance, if you have a block of iron whose elemental symbol is Fe, 
it's an abbreviation thing, and you were able to zoom in on it really, really closely and squinting really hard so that you could see the individual building blocks that are used to make up that entire bar of iron, what you would see is that each individual building block is a single little piece called an atom that is each an iron atom. Analogous thing would be true if you had a bar of silicon. Each building block or atom inside that entire bar at a really infinitesimally small size is a silicon atom. And all those silicon atoms are stuck to each other in a large collection of silicon atoms that on the macro scale make this bar that we're seeing here that I stole off of Wikimedia. The next term is molecules. Now molecules are substances that are made of two or more atoms joined together. Examples include H2O and CH4. So if you have a bunch of water, if you zoom in on an infinitesimal level so that you can see the individual building blocks of that water, you'll see that those individual building blocks are each made of three atoms each, an oxygen flanked by two hydrogens, H2O. Now because each building block in H2O is made of more than one atom, it's different from just an elemental substance like iron or silicon. See, the individual building blocks in a collection of iron are individual iron atoms, which is just one atom per building block. But the individual building blocks in a collection of water is three atoms, two H's and an O, which is a molecule. You see the difference between atom and molecule? Again, if you have two or more atoms stuck to each other through something that we call a bond, you have a molecule. Another example is methane, whose formula is CH4. If you have a bunch of methane gas, which is a major component in cow farts, it actually has five atoms per building block. One carbon and four hydrogens, CH4. Because it's made of more than one atom per building block, it's called a molecule. Are we good on that? Now, as it turns out, there are two different classes of molecules. The first is homonuclear molecules. Those are molecules that are made of two or more atoms of the same element, bonded or stuck together. Examples include H2 and O2, as well as O3, which is ozone, that has a funky smell. The second class of molecule is compounds. These are molecules that are made of two or more atoms of different elements that are bonded or stuck to each other. And again, examples include H2O and methane, as well as a bunch of other stuff that we'll see later on. Let's zoom in on O2 a little bit more tightly by looking at a cool little model that I also stole off of Wikimedia. I mean borrowed, I mean used with permission. You get the idea. The point is, if we have a cool model of what an individual O2 or oxygen gas molecule looks like, it might look something like this. Now, as you look at this, this has two red spheres that are kind of stuck or bonded to each other. <laughs> like that, right? Each of these spheres represents an individual oxygen atom, but because each unit of oxygen is actually made of two of those atoms bonded together, each individual unit is a molecule, specifically an O2 molecule. And this number two, which I call a subscript, it's a, it's a little number that's kind of small and pushed down a little bit, indicates the total number of atoms, in this case O atoms, that are found in each molecule of oxygen. Does that make sense? Well, let's get a little bit more complicated then. Here's a molecule, carbon dioxide, that has three atoms in each molecule. A central carbon atom represented by this darker colored sphere bonded to or stuck to two different adjacent oxygen atoms represented by the red spheres. You'll notice that this molecule's formula is CO2, indicating that there is one carbon and two oxygens per molecule of carbon dioxide. The subscript two, of course, tells us how many oxygens there are per molecule two, and there's no subscript next to the carbon right here, right? There's no number there. So whenever you see no subscript, it's an implied or understood one. So this is kind of like saying C1O2. So, so there's a one carbon there and then two oxygens. Got it? Let's get a little more complicated then. Here is water that we already saw, H2O, as well as ethanol, the alcohol found in drinking alcohol. This has a formula of C2H6O. Oh my heavens, what does that mean? Well, it means that each individual molecule ethanol has two carbon atoms. That number two indicates how many carbons there are. And they're represented by these darker spheres here, kind of stuck to each other. Six hydrogen atoms, they're the lighter gray spheres here. You can see kind of one, two, three, four. There's kind of a fifth one that we can only see a little bit there and then a sixth one up here, as well as one oxygen atom, this red sphere here. So at an individual building block level, if you zoomed into a collection of ethanol and saw the individual building blocks that comprise that entire collection of liquid, the individual building blocks would each look like this, having two carbons, six hydrogens, and one oxygen per. Make sense? Here's a more complicated one, the formula for aspirin, seen on H8O4. If you look at this and start counting spheres, you'll see that it does indeed have nine carbons, 
eight hydrogens and four oxygens. Okay, you can only see three oxygens or these red spheres. There's a fourth one that's kind of on the other side back here that's sort of being covered up. You can't really see. Sorry, it's not a rotating model, but hopefully you can at least imagine it. As you look at all these things, you'll notice that the oxygen molecule up top right here is a homonuclear molecule because it is a molecule, in other words, a thing that's made of two or more atoms stuck to each other, but both of the atoms are of the same element, oxygen in this case. All of these molecules down here are called compounds. Again, a compound is a molecule that is made of two or more different elements stuck to each other, which applies to all of these cases.